Iraq is where we begin tonight, in the nation's second largest city, Mosul. Iraqi forces are now in full control of that city, and victory has been declared over ISIS. In the waning days of the battle, Charlie Daggett headed into the heart of the beleaguered city. The destruction in the old city is everywhere you look. Not a building was left standing. They've just been leveled. This is what it costs to get rid of ISIS. This looks like Armageddon. Almost every single building in these neighborhoods has been flattened. It's just annihilated. I mean annihilated. It's of all the years that I've been covering conflicts in Iraq, I've never seen the level of destruction I've seen here in Mosul. I mean, you look around and there's just, there's just nothing left. Although ISIS fighters are gone, the mines and explosives they left behind still pose a major threat. But that's not the only danger that looms among the ruins. Thousands of children have been recruited by jihadists, taught to build bombs, work as spies, even execute prisoners. The cubs of the caliphate, as they're called, are meant to be the next generation of holy warriors. Charlie met some of these child soldiers, their families, and the people working to rehabilitate the radicalized. I've been covering the fight against ISIS for years, pretty much ever since it began throughout Syria and Iraq, but never before have we been able to dig down that deep and really spend the time talking to the people who are affected most, I mean, the families, the kids. And what struck me, especially when we got into the old city in Mosul, was the level of destruction. I mean, as far as the eye could see, whole neighborhoods were just dropped and leveled. But then you remember that, you know, those are only structures, and those structures can be rebuilt. There are people inside those homes, people that have been displaced, people that have been enslaved by ISIS. <laughs> People that had to live under ISIS, whether forcefully or whether they went willingly to the ISIS ideology. Then you had the others, the ones who had been kidnapped, the child soldiers, uh, who were forced to fight for ISIS. Some that were forced to become suicide bombers. There were young people that we met, ISIS prisoners that we spoke to, who we got the impression that they sort of willingly signed up for that. Then there was another young boy, Zikran. We would believe everything they would say, but when it comes to the teacher would come in the class and, and ask who would want to go and uh, explode themselves, all of them are screaming, we wanted to, we wanted to. He was separated from his family. His older brother he's never seen again. His father he's never seen again. He was only about 15 years old. Uh, at the time. We asked him, why do you think they were so interested in him? It's because he was younger and his mind could be changed. Were you willing to fight for ISIS? We, we believed everything they said. So he converted to Islam and he started to believe in the teachings that ISIS instructors and trainers were giving him. They would tell us that either they became Muslims or they should be killed. Cutting someone's head with a sword is just ugly to see. Though they taught, taught us at the religious school, it's something very normal to do. But still seeing it, it was very ugly. So I'm not entirely sure that this indoctrination that took place has come out. He hasn't had any professional uh, therapy, uh, which is needed. He hasn't had any counseling. He's just living on his own. He's got no job prospects. And the only thing that he really belonged to, and you can kind of see it in his eyes, were the pictures that he had when he's holding up that, those automatic weapons uh, in the photos uh, taken by ISIS, taken by friends. That's you. Yeah. You look like an ISIS fighter. So I truly believe that he believed in what he was doing. Yes, he was indoctrinated, but has that ideology come out? I'm not so sure. What struck me most though, and I'll never forget her, was Adiba, this Yazidi who 70 members of her friends and family, that inner circle, have disappeared. And then that, that, the thing I will never forget when uh, my little brother told my mom that don't be sad and don't think of anything. I mean, at least we're going to be killed together. He must have been terrified. Uh, I, and then I just escaped with my family before they arrived by 15 minutes. She went back. She could have gone to Germany where her family went. She went back specifically to help the young people and the mothers who were trapped. 
I don't know where she finds the strength because day in and day out, she follows these stories and she tries to talk people, young people, into sort of coming to, to the right side. My heart is broken, you know, since, since what happened to us. I mean, I left my life, I left so many things behind. I just want to do something, I just want to, just to work, to work, I mean, and be with my people. But in the end, you would have expected that somebody who had that sort of eternal optimism had some hope that it was going to get better. But she said no. Um, we're not getting any help for those people. I mean, I don't know, I mean, people just like listening and just then they're forgetting about it. You know, I said, if you could, you know, wave a magic wand, what would be a solution? She said, just therapists, hundreds of therapists to help the young people. Well, they're just not getting it. They're stuck in camps and they'll have to move on from this terrible destruction that is just on such a wholesale level. Not only will they never go home, but I don't think they'll ever be the same. These families have been ripped apart and it's going to be a huge danger for the future. I hope I will never get that moment that I will, I will give up. I hope it, I will never, never see that.